The Veterans Choice Program was supposed to make it easier for returning vets to get medical attention. It hasn't worked out that way. Some Chargers backers think a group of hotel owners is out to scuttle the downtown stadium convention center expansion. They've called for a boycott. And the reasons why UC San Diego faces stiff challenges in meeting its ambitious fundraising goals. I'm Mark Sauer. The Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, reporter Steve Walsh of KPBS News. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Good to see you today. Roger Scholey, who covers growth and development for the San Diego Union-Tribune. Hi, Roger. Hey, Mark. Good to see you. And Gary Robbins, who covers science and technology for the Union-Tribune. Hi, Gary. Hey, Mark. Glad you're here today. Well, shocking stories of veterans dying while waiting for care from the VA led Congress to act. The Veterans Choice Program was quickly authorized in 2014, too quickly it turns out. Congress gave the VA $10 billion, a mandate to allow veterans to find doctors outside the VA system, and 90 days to set it all up. And so far the results have been disheartening to say the least. Here's Navy vet Amanda Wirtz talking about her experience with Veterans Choice. This is February 23rd for an appointment scheduled March 23rd. January, I'm considering suicide because I'm in so much pain. I'm asking for relief. The Choice Program is giving me an appointment in March. So, Steve, long wait times, they still have it to it. What was the rush? Why did the uh, Congress have to hustle this together? Well, if you, um, if you talk to members of Congress, they say they were, they were facing a crisis here. You had uh, uh, the VA being accused of keeping secret wait times, concealing hundreds if not thousands of vets who were waiting on uh, long lines for appointments. They felt they had to act, do something very, very quickly. And some of whom this, actually died, of course, and some the, of them and the publicity was horrible. Indeed. So they felt that they moved Congress itself. You, you think of the notion of just the lack of bipartisan you know, action in Congress. Uh, not sweeping, on this one. <laughs> not on this one. Sweeping majorities in both the House and Senate. You have uh, Republicans like Jeff Miller. You've got uh, Democrats like Bernie Sanders working to craft some a piece of legislation first piece of legislation is introduced at the beginning beginning of june by august 7th uh president obama is signing this into law and giving the va 90 days to come up with a program all right that is lightning quick we do have a bite here from uh, congressman jeff miller who you, you referenced there and why it was set up so quickly if you don't think given the crisis that erupted in 2014 was the appropriate time to stand up a program like Choice. I don't know when you'd find a better time. All right, so do you uh, think it was uh, realistic to ask Miller about uh, how, how you could actually launch some massive program like this in 90 days? Yeah, so I mean, they, they felt that they just they didn't have any choice. When you talk to Congressman Miller, he'll say that the VA was doing a lot of this stuff. They were sending people to, to outside doctors. This wasn't the first time they had done something like this. But honestly, they had not done it really on, on quite this scale. They also added in everybody who was 40 miles away from a VA medical facility. They were then going to be allowed to go outside to an outside doctor. So there, there were a lot of balls in the air when this thing started. All right. So uh, they outsourced it, though. The VA wasn't going to do this internally and have their own staff or even hire more people to do it. They, they had to go find some companies who, who might be able to handle it. Right. This. Their first decision was, we can't do this. The, we don't have the resources of the VA. We can't move quickly enough. We can't do this. So let, how, what do we do now? So they went, they tried outside companies. They tried to bid this out, essentially. They had an industry day. They invited, I believe, like 57 different companies like WellPoint and Accenture to do this. And almost everybody came back and said, no, we can't, we can't do it in 90 yeah. days. They took one look and ran the other way. Huh? Right. So, and, uh, so who is running Veterans Choice? So there you go. And this is actually where I first encountered this story was I ran into TriWest at a, uh, when they were opening up a call center here. I didn't realize up until that point that it really had been farmed out to these two companies, HealthNet and TriWest. They were running a contract with the VA uh, to do something very similar called it patient-centered community care, PC3. They had just started that. This was months into it, maybe a little over a year into this program by the time Veterans Choice came along. Uh, and there were already problems with that program. The, uh, they were having uh, many of the same thing, long wait times, not enough doctors. The VA was scrambling to get uh, to assign other doctors to some of these patients that were on their wait lists. Uh, and then, but in the end, the VA decided these are the only two companies who are prepared to take it. 
And so they handed it to them. They got it. The music stopped for them. We do have one more bite here I want to get to. Uh, it's uh, Mac McGuire of TriWest on trying to meet the expectations we're talking about. Oh my God, you expect us to build networks and to have all these processes in place, all these contact centers, be able to do all these things at a very, very abbreviated schedule. And I think a lot of people went, are you crazy? So yes, are we, a little, were we crazy? In hindsight, maybe yes. But we're also, we felt like we were up to the challenge. All right. We just want to be given an opportunity to show that it's getting better and it's working. Well, so far it's a struggle, as your story points out, Roger. I don't understand what's so complicated about this. I mean, you make the appointments and you set them up, and they have thousands of people manning the phones. The VA has a lot of people. I, I just don't get the sense of understanding of why the system is so broken. Well, I mean, it, it frankly is. It's incredibly complicated. You're talking about a system that is, in the end, designed to serve veterans directly. You come in and you see their doctor. You start farming this out to folks in the community. Um, you create a whole nother layer of bureaucracy. In fact, now as they're looking to reform this Choice Act, they're looking at maybe taking some of this role back into the VA. So you're not having, maybe you'll have a contractor like TriWest, you know, creating the doctor networks, but you have a doctor or a nurse at the VA setting up the appointments, working directly with that outside doctor. So there's a continuity of, of a, a care. A bridge there. Gary? I remember when Obamacare started and they had all those problems with people signing up. The administration essentially created a SWAT team. They went with really deliberate speed. They grabbed a lot of people from a lot of really different disciplines and brought them in, and it was less than 90 days. Mm -hmm. Is there no way for the administration to create some type of SWAT team that's beyond these healthcare people that have been provided? I mean, to bring in this, just experts who are used to working very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Well, they've had 18 months or so to, to do this, and the VA says we're on it. They've got a lot of new people on this. They're, um, they're also, they're looking at revamping this law. Congress is getting back in the game here again. In fact, I think they were, they were kind of at ramming speed to try to uh, improve and then expand Veterans Choice to all of the, the sort of community care that the VA has. Uh, I, and I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but this is a joint investigation we did with National Public Radio, with NPR. Mm -hmm. And so this has been appearing over the last several days on NPR. And um, uh, we've had the head of the, the VA Health Center, uh, uh, Dr. Shulkin, uh, acknowledging many of those concerns. And it seems like the effort in Congress seems to be slowing somewhat to maybe give them, rather than go through and try to rush through another set of Give them some breathing space. To maybe extend Veterans yeah. Choice another year and give them another year to maybe work some of these issues through. Because some of these issues involve the VA just being really behind on things like processing paperwork. Mm -hmm. And like they are hundreds of thousands of claims behind processing just their normal claims here. So there's a, a lot of has to be done to make this system work. I mean, the VA is just enormous. How's, how's it working in San Diego? How's Veterans Choice working here? Well, you get, um, uh, Amanda's obviously mm -hmm. from San Diego. She's not we happy. Still have, uh, we still have some long wait times in some areas uh, here, especially for mental health uh, in, in those areas. And so in the end, when you look at Veterans Choice on the national level, it's kind of hard to get the full statistics here. But that, you know, bottom line, there are more veterans right now waiting more than 30 days for a VA appointment than we're waiting before the program yeah, Again. and that's so, kind of a bottom line a fact right there. Huh? Yeah, so Be there obviously there's still a lot to do. Now, before we leave this segment, I did want to throw out uh, for everybody here. For many years, we were all urged as a country support the troops at all. And why is in America we're, we seem so ready to go to war, especially in the Middle East in the last few decades here, but uh, we just appear unprepared to handle the casualties? Well, I mean... You have a crisis in war, you have a crisis, long wait times, people act very quickly, but then it takes staying on these issues for a long period of time, and that's, I tend, people tend to take their eye off the ball. So it's a crisis extension from the war itself and the slow-mo crisis and that the, displays out the And the nature of their, their uh, problems is more complicated than it used to be, isn't it? With all the rehabilitation. Oh, certainly with TBI, but what we're talking about, the, what really is the crisis that's generating the wait times are not these returning combat vets because so mm -hmm. few, I mean, relatively few people are, are in the military now compared to what they were uh, traditionally. What we're, the crisis is the number of Vietnam vets who are aging at this point, and they have a lot of complex issues. In fact, there's a giant bubble here mm -hmm. where we'll see an increase in VA care, and then it will start to slow down over time. Mm -hmm. And this is really the crisis that they have to struggle. How are we going to handle this influx now? Do we build bigger VA hospitals, or do we farm it out to doctors? This mm -hmm. is really the, the issue for the country right now. All right, we are going to move on. I'm sure we'll be doing more reporting on that as we, uh, as we move along. 
Well, two groups hoping to keep the Chargers in San Diego are pushing for a boycott of certain hotels. The group Save Our Bolts and San Diego Stadium Coalition claim three hotel owners are working behind the scenes to block the Chargers' plan to build a $1.8 billion stadium slash convention center expansion and this complex would be downtown. Now, the bulk of that funding would come from a big hike in hotel occupancy taxes under the plan. Roger, start with, start with this uh, boycott. Who, who's behind it? Well, why do they say they, they need to do this? Well, these are two uh, fan groups, and they have a big social media outreach to uh, fans in San Diego and then links to fan groups all over the country. And they are annoyed that the hotel industry has not come on board with this convention center stadium concept and they blame these three companies for um, dragging their feet and not supporting it and they want to uh, call them out and say don't go to their hotels and maybe they'll come back on board. Now there's a lot of hotels I don't want to read a list of 35 <laughs> hotels but give us some of the big names that people would recognize some of the hotels. Well involved. the Evans Hotels is uh, they have the Bahia Catamaran and the Lodge of Torrey Pines is the most uh, prominent you might say. Uh, Bill Evans has been very active in the hotel business and Big industry. name in the hotel business yeah. here for a long time. And um, the town and country, Terry Brown heads that company. His family's it, head the town. The in country. Mission Valley, of course. Yeah, yeah. for mm -hmm. 60 years, next to the Union Tribune. The old yeah. building. Yeah, right. And so uh, they are, um, uh, they're blamed for donating to, to campaign, uh, campaign contributions to people running for office, like Mayor Kevin Faulkner. So uh, they also are kind of blaming them for steering money toward the politicians. The politicians are not taking a, taking a strong support for the, the project. So um, I don't know, boycotts usually don't work. And in this case, it's, it's kind of um, a volunteer effort. So it's nothing really yeah. uh, backed by anybody's finances. I did ask the chargers if they're for it. And they said they knew about it, but they haven't taken a position. What about the hoteliers? What's their and, response? And the hotel people, they won't even discuss the boycott. The, the three I would call them, and they wouldn't call back, and they're Spokesman said, We've, we're studying the wording. I called today and said, well, you've studied it. What do you say? We have nothing further to say. So no. I, I think of the case is if we say nothing, it'll go away. It'll go away. Now this, and it may, who knows. Now this, mm -hmm. this, ho this supposed campaign against the Chargers plan to, to is, and of course this is, they're out there, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they're out there getting petitions. We're trying to get this on the ballot to, to vote for this tax in, mm -hmm. uh, in November, on November's ballot. Uh, this, I haven't seen anything of it. I kind of watch the news with this show every week. And uh, is, is it a stealth campaign? They're supposedly trying to block uh, the Chargers' I mean, efforts. I mean, I'm so thrilled not to be writing stories about the Chargers Stadium here every other day because mm -hmm. it is sort of it's the same old thing over and over right, again. Right. Basically, they, they're both two campaigns trying to uh, ra uh, collect 67,000 signatures. Right. Uh, one is for by the Chargers, one is by the Corey Briggs uh, group. Mm -hmm. The, law, the famous lawyer who's been involved in these things. Right. So there's two separate uh, initiatives for the ballot. Mm -hmm. yeah, signature gatherers are out there. You've probably seen them at the grocery stores trying and, to get and they the signatures. And they're getting paid up something like $12 a signature, right. which is almost <laughs> which is more than the minimum wage. I mean, it might as well become know. a professional signature <laughs> it gatherer. It may be a full-time job for a lot of these <laughs> folks. I mean, good for them. And um, I guess it's it's okay they're doing this. I just wonder, in November, with all the, the presidential campaign and a bunch of state items on the ballot. We have a tax increase by Sandag for infrastructure in San Diego. So it's going to be a long ballot, lots of stuff. And, and marijuana like, probably going to be on the ballot, yeah. legalizing so California. So in, in doubt, fall. vote no. It's kind of yeah. the usual yeah. uh, fallback position. And then you got com competing measures. you got a lot of uh, confusion there. And we should say in terms of campaigns, none of this campaign will really start until these things get qualified for the ballot. And then you'll right. see money behind and groups coming out and billboards and flyers and right. everything else that we see in interviews. And done. I think the, the big question to me is, will the charges be on a winning streak or not in the fall? Right. Just as the November election nears, right. sort of like the Padres in 1998, we voted on the Petco right after project. the World Series appearance. Yeah. There, and that but in this case, the Chargers weren't, didn't do so well last year. Are they going to do well this year? That'll fit, figure into the voters' attitude about it. Okay. Now let's get back. You mentioned Mayor, Mayor Faulkner here. What's his stand on the Chargers' downtown convadium proposal? That's the stadium. We, we don't convention. use that word, but you know, I know you don't like that word. That's why I <laughs> threw it out there. But anyway, this is a stadium convention center right. expansion complex here. What, what's Mayor Faulkner saying? None of about the that? none of the city council members or the board of supervisors, for that matter, or almost any other elected official locally has come out in favor of this project. Or the mayor. Or the mayor, yeah. particularly the mayor. And um, this Hasn't this project been announced weeks and weeks ago? Mm -hmm. uh, what are these folks waiting for? 
They're waiting for the June 7th election. Okay. And then when that's done, then they can take a position. Okay. So they'll see which what happens in that result. Uh, are, we, are we actually facing a fall campaign and Mayor Faulkner could win outright in, in June and not really have to be right. in the hot seat here? So it's uh, it's... It's so, very complicated. I mean, the both both measures are very difficult to understand if you just read the ballot language, mm -hmm. the one that by the charge is like 108 pages or something. And um, I wonder how many people will just say, I love the charge, vote yes, or I don't care, I'll vote no, or something. So it's well, really kind of... Well, what do you think? We're all residents here, we're all uh, voters here. What do you think? You think well, it's I got the June the ballot in the mail the other day, mm -hmm. and that's pretty sure. sizable. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. not going to read my way all the way through right. that. So and that's just June, June and November oh, figures to be a lot bigger. It's going to be huge. Yeah. So I don't see... The language is often very difficult to understand as well. So making a pitch by any particular group is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it may frustrate voters more than anything. Mm -hmm. Steve, well, they, they know, go for this? I, I, I don't know. So I, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm still a little new to this initiative process. And, I, I, and covering it as a, like a, an election, I mean, how do, you, how do you know whether there's enough excitement out of there? Because I'm not exactly sure I'm seeing a lot of excitement right now for this. Well, process. you know, it's, 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 there's two of them. Yeah, there. there's two. It's a two stage thing, too, because right. they've got to get the signatures. They've got to get it qualified. And then they kind of shift into campaign mode. And as we say, if they both qualify, then it gets mm -hmm. really tricky. Well, the tricky thing, usually there's a long process of vetting a project, having a commission or a task force dealing with it, a lot of. Uh, public meetings going forward, then finally the wording comes out and there's this coalition of supporters and that goes forward, which is what happened in Petco. In this case, the team itself took it on itself to uh, write the rules, uh, raise the money or spend the money to put it on the ballot and then presumably finance the, the campaign in the fall. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a just reverse mm -hmm. of what usually happens on these things. So voters are going to have to go on faith. Or I guess just basic love of the Chargers. Well, I mean, I think, it, but, but it, it may boil it, it down boils to down that. To, do you want the Chargers or not? That's, right. That's the, really the the question in both. And cases. then the whole question of do we need two thirds of a vote or just a simple yeah. majority, which will get, get all <laughs> tangled up in legalities mm -hmm. as we move but forward. But that's the marvel of uh, California's progressive. 1910 yeah. reforms. Yeah, and we get it every time. <laughs> Welcome to California, <laughs> Thank Steve. You. All right, we are going to move from this segment now. There'll be a lot more to come, I'm sure. Well, it sounds like an impressive goal, raise $2 billion in private donations over the next decade. That's what UC San Diego has set out to do, but that goal is far less than that raised by other notable universities, even in the UC system. Uh, Gary, start with this fundraising campaign. What does the uh, University UC San Diego plan to do with this money? Well, that is part of the problem. The university isn't being very clear about what it needs to raise the money for. This all kind of surfaced about a month ago when it was announced that their chief fundraiser, only two years into the job, had either left or something else happened. He had been handpicked by the chancellor to run this campaign, and so suddenly he's gone, no one's really talking. I look at it more closely to ask, well, when did the campaign start? When was it supposed to end? Um, how long was it going to be? Uh, what were your priorities? And initially, we got very little information, or we got conflicting information. People were like very leery to talk about a campaign mm -hmm. that the university says is really essential to its future and its ability to handle this really intense growth. Mm -hmm. I finally got a hold of Chancellor Kozla, and he says, well, it's a 10-year campaign, and it'll probably end roughly five years from now. Well, those are longer than most campaigns, but still there was a lot of loose ends. The, the university isn't being precise about what it needs money for which could be a problem because if you say you need $2 billion and you're struggling to say exactly what you need it for, then that may make it more difficult to put your hand up. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, they'd like to, in the long run, get more students. They'd like to... Uh, well, they're know. going to get more students whether they like it or not. Um, <laughs> yeah. The university is... colleges. Grown, yeah. <laughs> well, they uh, have added 8,000 students in less than 10 years at UC San Diego. Wow, so that's Plans a jump already. Right, and they're going to add another 6,000 within the next five years. Mm -hmm. Now, already today, there's a waiting list of 3,000 students for housing. They have $300 million in immediate needs for classrooms and laboratories. There are hundreds of million dollars more that they need for a variety of buildings and to flesh things out. Um, so they have, in, they have real big needs now. They don't have enough money to go forward, and they're really unclear with how their fundraising procedure is going to go forth. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Roger? The, the, I'm a, I should say I'm a UCSD graduate, so I know this. Uh, I get uh, mailings from them all the time asking for money. So I think the issue that you brought up was in the sense of other universities, the alumni support isn't as strong or widespread as it is as it should be. Right. So right. That what, was interesting what, in your story. So why, it's very minuscule here I mean, compared yeah, to the others. I mean, there are plenty of alumni <laughs> have gone through and, and made 
millions of dollars in fabulous camp uh, right. com uh, companies and professors and so on. So there's plenty of alumni yeah. wealth they that up? they could. That well, they this could is where the university made a strategic mistake. Um, they've admitted recently that they essentially ignored alumni for most of their existence because they always thought the state would provide the money they needed. Now that's a bad strategy to begin with. You're always going to need money and you're going to need your alumni to be part of your university. It's a family. You want to help people get jobs and they in turn donate back to you. And the cut in state funding occurred over a 15 year period roughly so there was time to react to all these forces but they didn't. Mm -hmm. So right now they don't know who many of their alumni are, they don't know what they need. Consequently, they get roughly five, four, four or five percent from their alumni in their overall fundraising. Nationally, the average is 25 percent. Mm -hmm. um, they're having just this god-awful problem, and there's a bigger problem on top where they're not creating a traditional college experience. You know, right, your story is very interesting on that score. Uh, how come? Because we go out and you see that campus, if you're not connected with the university, you have a mm -hmm. reason or business out there. It's a beautiful campus. I mean, I went to Michigan <laughs> State in East Lansing in the middle of February. It was quite different from <laughs> sitting out there looking at the Pacific from UCSD. It is a big campus, but they've never engaged their students. There hasn't been this big drive for social clubs, for fraternities, um, to really get them involved. There's been very little going on during this current campaign right now about whether they should move to Division I sports. Right. The administration has said very little, and this is something that has worked elsewhere. Um, students also complain that the university is very paternalistic toward them. There's, a, there's some friction there. And it sometimes feels like the university has marginalized its own students, saying, you know, there's an attitude like, they're, they're science kids, they're engineering kids, they wouldn't be interested. Uh -huh. But just turn your head to UCLA to Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, Stanford, which are well, science schools that are mm -hmm. big in I'd sports. Ar I'd argue that from the beginning, UCSD was founded as a science and engineering school. So was UCLA. So that, mm -hmm. Well, but so UCLA, UCLA now has you know a wide range of social and uh, social and humanities programs. UCSD does too, but the I forgot what the total like forty or sixty percent of students are engineering majors. And I remember as a student there that usually the people who were active in clubs and things were not science people. They were like I was a history major, so and it's and it's That's physically history. isolated. Yeah, yeah, it is <laughs> up on that Mesa. I mean, it. unlike yeah. UCLA, which is right, right in the middle of Westwood, and, and mm -hmm. of course Berkeley and and Cal. I mean, it's kind of up on that Mesa. It's not far from La Jolla and places, but it's it's alone up there. They, um, students call it an island, and the island is surrounded by housing that they really can't afford. I mean, housing is at a premium. That's causing part of the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with this thing about engineering. There's a stereotyping going on. Go to MIT, go to Caltech. There's a sense of school spirit there that's extraordinary. They're engineers, and they're not chemists. They're great football. Yeah, but they're known <laughs> for other things. <laughs> you know, the rivalry between MIT and Caltech right. is something that creates a sense of spirit right. and community, yeah. and it just doesn't exist in here. And when you're talking about raising this kind of money, it seems like one of the issues that has come out really central in the presidential campaign is just the cost of college at this point. It's student it's debt and student loan. Right. Is any of this money going to make this experience a little cheaper for that student? Maybe make it a little friendlier for the average student? <laughs> or is all of this just going to be bigger amenities and football? In a word, no. And and salaries no, for None of it will go for football. Right yeah. now, the average, um, a student yeah. coming out of UC San Diego has an average debt of $22,000. That's average in California, although it's less than Stanford, where they have a lot of money coming in. Right. But it is an issue. They want to raise a lot of money for scholarships, which do help. Um, but that figure, indebtedness, has been going up in All right. California. We are going to watch for your reporting as we move forward and see how they do with that campaign. We've got a little time left here, and I, before we end it for today, I did want to note the UT, where you folks still work, and I worked for 27 years, did something this week. They moved uh, downtown, back downtown, after decades of Mission Valley. You did a story on that, Roger. Yes, it was, uh, I was uh, with you. We were in the downtown bureau for a long time. So the, uh, and what was the Comerica Bank building right, going to be uh, the UT building? UT now. building. And Sixth the and significance B, of this say. to me is that a newspaper uh, needs to know the heart and the spirit of the public. And being in an industrial park or an office park in suburbia, uh, Mission Valley is something like that. Mm -hmm. You walk outside the door and you don't see a single person who's worth talking to. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you walk outside our building downtown 600 B Street, every block there's somebody to talk to or meet or follow or look at. So it's just more stimulating to be in an urban center. What, uh, so far, Gary, I, everybody like it down there? I think that they do. I like it. I have a corner office. Mm -hmm. I don't have an office, excuse me. <laughs> My chair is you in the corner. You have to be in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks, one part of it looks out at uh, the harbor and the other at Coronado Bridge, and the sun floods yeah. in, and I can see and feel the city, and that's so important. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Right. And you were, and of course, the UT was downtown many years right, for ago. Right, 103 years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we left in 1973 because uh, they had outgrown the property at Se 2nd and Broadway, and um, it made sense to have the printing plant and an office building uh, at, at eight, Interstate 8 and 163. And Mission Valley was just developing. And, and the only reason we moved back is because the, uh, the company was sold and the printing is changed to L.A., so there was no connection anymore between mm -hmm. the office, the office work or the journalistic work and the, and the production. But to down and back into the heart of the city as opposed to being on the vortex of a couple of freeways hard by a, right. a mall out there, I think that's <laughs> got to be a, a great news for everybody. I'm going to get down and see my old colleagues and uh, have lunch there in a, in a week or so and check out your new digs. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Steve Walsh of KPBS News, Roger Scholey of the San Diego Union Tribune, and Gary Robbins, also of the Union Tribune. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable. Should tumble and fall, or the mountain should crumble to the sea. Just as long as you stand, stand by me.